Hello, I'm Joseph Bendy. And I'm Deanna Ortelli. These old fire trucks at the Travel Town Museum in Griffith Park have logged lots of miles. And we're going to do a little traveling ourselves. I'll explore the possibilities of flying 25 times the speed of sound in a brand new kind of aircraft. I'll check out the controls in the simulated cockpit. Back on Earth, I'll take a day trip to Paris, P-E-R-R-I-S, that is, about an hour and a half southeast of Los Angeles. Here is one of Southern California's best-kept secrets, the largest railroad museum in the West. California is known as the land of the freeway, but now toll roads. Yes, toll roads are proposed as an answer to our increasingly clogged highways. I'll explore the pros and cons of turning freeways into payways. All this and a lot more on Transit 2000. Every day, millions of travelers board airplanes at terminals like this around the world. That's not going to change very much in the 21st century. But ever since the Wright brothers, there have been dramatic changes in the way we fly. And there's one new plane that's being planned for the future that could revolutionize long distance air travel. Since 1981, the workhorse of the American space program has been the space shuttle. But the launch of the new space shuttle Endeavour marks both a beginning and an end. NASA has announced that after Endeavour, no more shuttles will be built. So what's next for the 21st century? In America, an experimental aircraft is being developed to answer that question. This is NASA animation of the X-30, the first generation of what's called a National Aerospace Plane, or NASP. Robert Schwanz is the chief engineer of hypersonics at Rockwell International. One thing we're trying to do with this aircraft is reduce the cost of uh, space flight. So the cost of space flight here is reduced substantially, maybe a 50th to 100th of the cost of the uh, shuttle. That's one of the projected costs. The reason it's so cheap, or why the cost is reduced, is uh, it does not require the large support structure that uh, rockets and rocket-based uh, craft do, such as the shuttle. Retired Major General Joe Engel is a former NASA astronaut with the shuttle program and a consultant for the X-30. This airplane will, will take off from a runway. So it is, in essence, uh, an airplane when it takes off. It, it, uh, it takes off from a runway under its own power. It depends on lift from its lifting surfaces to get it airborne and to start it in its climb and acceleration. The National Aerospace Plane represents a totally new kind of manned spaceflight. Rocket launch vehicles like the shuttle bulldoze their way straight up through space, weighed down by booster rockets and heavy fuel tanks that are jettisoned along the way. The NASP will angle into space like a conventional airplane, using lighter, more efficient, air-breathing scramjet engines. This airplane, the X-30, will attain the same speeds essentially as the space shuttle does, that being the speed required to maintain an orbit, an Earth orbit. And that's, uh, about Mach 25 or a little over 18,000 miles an hour. Creating engines capable of these astonishing speeds is only one of the technical challenges facing the X-30. The NASP is entering a new realm of aviation, demanding new materials that can resist surface temperatures reaching 5,000 degrees and computer control systems that can test and execute hypersonic maneuvers. There's a lot that's new about NASP technology, but one of the plane's most innovative features is how it's being designed and built. In 1990, NASA and the Department of Defense put together an unprecedented national team of American aerospace companies. Such government and private enterprise consortiums have been the secret of Japan and Europe's recent technological successes. The X-30 isn't scheduled to fly until the turn of the century, but with the help of NASA animation and sophisticated simulators like this one at Rockwell International, we can get a glimpse of what air travel might be like in the 21st century. We're starting the, uh, the descent now from 10,000 feet, and the little airplane symbol that you see right at the intersection of those two black runways is actually the flight path market. We can maneuver back and forth and line ourselves up for landing. 
It's an unpowered flight. There's no thrust at all from the engines. We'll go ahead and put the landing gear down. And we're coming through 600 feet. You can see the, the end of the runway coming up there. Coming through 100 feet, 40 feet, 20 feet, and touchdown. Given today's economic climate, it may be years before this NASA dramatization of an X-30 flight becomes reality. But government-private enterprise partnerships like the NASP national team represent a promising model for many aspects of America's technological future. And when it comes to transportation, that could include more efficient mass transit, as well as ways to explore the edges of outer space. I just love ghost stories. That's one of the reasons we've come here. This is a graveyard, but not for people, for trains. There's a lot of miles and a lot of memories in these old railroad relics. But you want to know what makes this place really special? Some of the ghosts here are alive. In 1958, when service was discontinued in Los Angeles, this electric trolley was left for dead, destined for the scrap heap. But it found a new life here, the Orange Empire Railway Museum in Paris, California, southeast of Riverside. The museum is open to the public seven days a week, but it's weekends when the old scrap heap survivors come alive. Whoop. After 11 a.m., every few minutes a reborn train rumbles down one of the museum's lines of tracks. The museum's collection sprawls over 60 acres, from freights to trolleys, antique steamers, sturdy diesels, and urban electrics. It's the biggest collection of classic trains in the West. The Orange Empire Railroad Museum is a special place, and the museum's members and volunteers are a special breed. The museum's president is Tom Jacobson. Well, I've been involved with the museum since approximately 1975. It was founded in 1956 by 14 guys, only three of whom were old enough to sign articles of incorporation. We have approximately 1,100 members in the museum, and on a given weekend, uh, we can have uh, around 100 people down here doing all sorts of things involved uh, with restoration, operating the trains, or just helping out here at the museum. Right now, 15 trains are in the process of restoration at the museum. Unpaid volunteers do all the work. It's washing out the inside of the boiler. Well, that's really easy to do now. I just took a packing hook. I got that one packing hook yeah, there. bent. It's a little building. A single restoration can take as long as five years and cost as much as $300,000. What keeps the museum alive and well is dedication, donations, and a lot of love. 